Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 70, The Scottish Prisoner, week two. Well, hello, welcome back. So this week has been interesting. We found out when season three would premiere. Well, at least we got the month, which is September. And it is going to be on the heels of Outlander being at the San Diego Comic-Con this year, which is fantastic. That momentum will be really good for viewership. I know it's a really long wait, but Voyager is an intensely challenging book in different ways than Dragonfly and Amber was. We have land and sea and vastly differing locations. I think it is going to be absolutely worth the wait. I'm hopeful. And since I am posting both week two and three of the Scottish Prisoner series this weekend, Wednesday night was a wildly fun Twitter chat. It was basically a free-for-all. It was a fun fest. We talked about the show and all kinds of other things. And Richard, who wrote episode 205, popped up and joined in for a little while. That was a really nice surprise. So let's dive right in. Chapter 3, An Irishman, A Gentleman. Hellwater, April 2nd. Jamie was forking hay for the horses, and he's thinking an Irishman, a gentleman. That's what Betty had said, and it was running through his mind over and over. Who could it be? What did he have to do with Betty? Could it be a Jacobite? And that chilled him even further. The Jacobite cause was dead, and that part of his life with it. Jamie couldn't figure out why anyone would want to find him, or how could anyone know he was at Hellwater. And he starts thinking of his low standing, and he'd wished somebody would try to beat him so he'd have an outlet for violence. Because if he were a slave, he would get beaten. If he were indentured servant, he might get beaten for things. But he was a paroled prisoner. So he was doing time, but it's a different situation. And can you imagine that he has nothing? He works, he sleeps, he works, he sleeps. He can't go anywhere. And we see him in the pre-dawn darkness. And it was starting to give way to the sunrise. And the illusion of freedom was gradually fading as his prison of the main house came into view. I love this symbolism. It's a sweet illusion. He's outside, no shackles, no bars. But he's a prisoner nonetheless. He can't leave the property without permission. And he makes sure at this point the other two grooms are still up in the loft before ducking into the loose box he had been in the night before. When he investigates the box, he notices all the odors and scents in the air, and he sees the spot where he had lain the night before, and oh sweet Jamie blushes. And he looks to see where someone could have been standing had they been in the box with him, and he really hoped no one had been in the box. Well, he relieved his sexual tension. And his mind is going in all different directions, and the only Irishman he could think of had to do with Lord John Gray. He had found one for him once. And it had been a year and a half since Lord John had visited Hellwater. Prior to that, he'd visited quarterly to check on Jamie. But Jamie was really hoping he would never see Lord John again. Going back to the Irishman, Lord John had offered a bargain to Jamie. If he would write letters to known Jacobites inquiring after a matter of interest to him, 
He would instruct Lord Dunsany to allow Jamie to be able to openly write to his family in the Highlands and also to receive letters from them. Remember, that's what Geneva used to blackmail Jamie into sex. It was a contraband letter. Jamie accepted the proposal and did as he was asked. And an Irish Jacobite came up. He had no idea what Lord John Gray did with the information. And oh, at that last meeting of theirs, things were said. But gosh, that Irishman couldn't have anything to do with Lord John Gray. Jamie was trying to puzzle it out, and he doesn't like when he can't figure things out. This day was no more than the night ceasing. It was gray and foggy. And his hand worked as a weather vane, telling him with its aching it was going to rain. Jamie mindlessly worked. He was chilled and damp. And he thought he needed to speak to Betty to get some more information. He knew the maids took their meals with the housekeeper in her sitting room. He wasn't allowed past the kitchen, though. But he wondered, what would Lord Dunsany do if he simply went in the house? He couldn't dismiss him, after all. That made Jamie laugh, and it brightened his gloomy spirit. And then he thought maybe when the Dunsanys went to church, he would be able to speak to Betty. Jamie was the only one who could drive them. Otherwise, he wasn't allowed off the estate, as I said before. Betty would attend Lady Isabel, and that timing might work. And he had to safely figure out how to get a note to her. And then his mind goes back to this Irishman. What would he want with Alex Mackenzie, unless, of course, it was Jamie Fraser he was after? And Hanks, one of the other groomsmen, interrupts Jamie's thoughts. He wants a favor. A storm was coming, and he asked Jamie to take out a string of horses. And Jamie agrees. It would give him a chance to go where the Irishman wanted to meet up with him. The Fells. April 3rd. Jamie goes to the Fells. He goes to reconnoiter and let the horse breathe. He needs to get a lay of the land and follow his instincts. He describes how winter is not gone from here. The landscape, an old shepherd's cottage. It had been months since he'd been up there. He thinks he sees something in the shepherd's hut. Jamie gets off his horse, Augustus, and hobbles him. He walks along the ridge to get a better view, and he sees a man. He was watching the hut also. Jamie thought the man looked familiar. As he was thinking, his foot dislodged a small rock, and that was enough noise to make the man look up. Well, and is it not himself? Well met, Jamie, dear, well met. Quinn, is it you? They had seen each other last in 1746. Jamie was 25 and starving with the Jacobite army. Quinn was a year younger, and Jamie had a sense of dismay over the lines on Quinn's face and the gray in his hair. But Quinn kept his emotions to himself. And Jamie says, Betty could have said his name. And Quinn hugs Jamie, and it surprised him to feel the sting of tears. He squeezed Quinn back a bit longer to fight them back. Here's how Quinn responded. She knows my name, but I wasn't sure you'd come if you knew twas me. Quinn stood back, brushed an unashamed knuckle under his own eyes, and laughed. By the blessed mother, Jamie, it's glad him to see you. And I you. That much was true. Jamie left alone the question of whether he would have come knowing it was Quinn who waited on the fells. He sat down slowly on a rock to gain a moment. It wasn't that he disliked the man, quite the opposite, but to see this bit of the past rise up before him like a ghost from blood-soaked ground roused feelings he'd gone to great trouble to bury, and memories were stirring that he didn't want back. Beyond that, 
Instinct had given over muttering in his ear and was talking plain and clear. Quinn had been one of Charles Stewart's intimates, but never a soldier. He fled to France after Culloden, or so Jamie had heard. What the devil was he doing here now? Quinn tells Jamie Betty has quite an eye for him, and Jamie assures him it's a clear field with her. Dinna fash yourself that I'd queered your pitch. Dinna fash yourself that I'd queer your pitch. <laughs> That's quite a line. I like it. Quinn blinked and Jamie realized it was one of Claire's English sayings from the future. Quinn seemed to understand the meaning anyway. Turns out Betty is Quinn's late wife's sister, and there must be something in the Bible against betting your departed wife's sister. Jamie's read the Bible several times, and he doesn't remember any such thing saying that. And he tells Quinn he's sorry for his wife's passing. Has she been dead long? Quinn says she's not really deceased if you take my meaning. <laughs> She left him for greener pastures after Culloden, and she's inherited quite well from her latest late husband. Quinn says what he wants to speak to Jamie about. Jamie's not interested in speaking about Claire. He'd rather have his toenails removed with horse nail pliers, actually. Tell us how you really feel, Jamie. Culloden was on the same list as Claire, along with Blackjack Randall and his son William. Those were all the things he didn't want to discuss. Feeling nervous, Jamie gets up. It's the cause, not the battle, Quinn wants to discuss. Jamie thinks they are one and the same, and the cause is dead. Apparently, Jamie is wrong that the cause is dead. Quinn continues. The cause may have suffered some reverses in Scotland. Reverses, Jamie exclaimed. You call what happened at Drummacy reverses? But it's alive and thriving in Ireland. All Jamie can say is, Jesus. Ah, oh, thought that would gladden your heart, lad. That's how he was interpreting Jamie, but that's not what Jamie was thinking at all. There's an invasion planned. And this is where Jamie comes in. So, he says. And Jamie continues to make exclamations and asks him if he's mad. And Quid wants to know if Jamie has heard of the cup of the Druid King. Jamie is exasperated and tells Quinny he has work to do. He agrees that Jamie has work to do, but then goes on to explain. Here's what he says about the cup. It's the ancient possession, O oh, the kings of Ireland, the cup and is, given to the king of kings by the chief druid himself, so far back folk have forgotten the time of it. But the people know it still, it's spoken of in the legends, and tis a powerful symbol of kingship. Think now, how would it be, Prince Sharla, riding into Dublin, standing in the courtyard, O oh, Dublin Castle, between the gates of fortitude and justice, with the cup and raised high as he claims all of Ireland for his father. And I love what Jamie says. Well, since you ask. And Quinn thinks that the people would rise in the thousands, that they could take England with scarce a shot fired. And Jamie is not convinced. Have you seen the English army? Oh, yes. And here's where Jamie comes in. Turns out the abbot at the monastery is none other than Murtaugh's cousin, Michael Fitzgibbons. And Quinn finally stops talking to breathe. Jamie tells him no, not for all the tea in China. Now this confuses Quinn. It's another clarism. Isn't it interesting that he's quoting her after a decade and a half without her? Hmm. Jamie says he'll not have his uncle try to get Michael to part with it. Quinn wants Jamie to go to the monastery himself to get the cup. Jamie makes quite a face, and this causes Quinn to laugh. 
Jamie says he's a prisoner of war, but he must have told you as much. Quinn says it doesn't matter. So really what Quinn wants is to have someone that Father Michael trusts and at the same time someone known to be at the right hand of the stewards who can swear that the cup and won't be misused but put to its right and sacred purpose in restoring a Catholic monarch to the throne of Ireland and a man who can raise money and lead an army. People trust you, you know. They listen when you speak, and men will follow you without question. It's known of you. And Jamie assures him it's no longer known of him. No, no longer. But Quinn believes God has chosen Jamie for this task. Doesn't that sound a bit like the Bonnie Prince believing God chose him for the task and Culloden went down the tubes? And Jamie thinks that God had best look elsewhere, Quinn. The blessing of bride and Michael be upon you. Goodbye. <laughs> Jamie left. He and hobbled to the horse. And without meaning to look back at the shepherd's hut, he did. Quinn was standing there. He raises a hand, saying, See in Dublin town, Stuart Gulbra. And his laughter followed Jamie. Ugh. Here Jamie is, minding his own business, a paroled prisoner of war, and this Jacobite from a decade and a half gone finds him to stir the pot. Jamie was a plethora of emotions. He was feeling fearful and impatient and irritation, dismay, and also joy at seeing Quinn again. Even if he did have a fat hated scheme he was trying to get Jamie involved in, to see the face of a friend. Bloody Irishman, he muttered with a smile. What would Quinn do now? Find someone else to help him? Jamie wouldn't mind talking to him again, wondering about the others left alive after Culloden. A sudden leg cramp had Jamie feeling a ghost pacing by his stirrup. He reassured the startled horse, but Jamie's heart was racing, and he tried to breathe to calm it. He knew he would dream of whoever he felt near his stirrup tonight. Who would he see? I've always adored the spiritual side of Jamie. He's connected not only to the natural, but the supernatural. His faith runs to his core. Well, he dreamt of a drunken Charles Stewart, and Charles was speaking Gaelic to him. And Jamie knew in his dream that wasn't right because Charles had no Gaelic. And in this dream, Charles was pointing out a row of heads on spikes. Then Quinn appeared in the dream, grabbing Jamie and telling him to look at a woman. As a matter of fact, all the heads were women. The one he saw was Geneva, eyeless, staring back. From the corner of his eye, the next head had light brown curly hair. At this, he dropped the torch he was carrying in the dream onto the wet cobbles and woke to Charles' drunken laughter. But it wasn't Charles's laughter. It was Hank's laughing in his sleep. And Jamie could smell urine. He'd pissed himself again. Ugh. And Jamie works to reorient himself. He notices the moon. He hears the loft mice stirring. Hanks settles back into sleep. The mice scratched, rustling the straw. Just like Claire, Jamie has his tells. How does he reset? How does he reconnect? How does he know what's what and where he fits? They're very similar that way. Jamie tried not to sleep again and could, until he could shake off the bad dream, but he did, and this time it was of Betty. He reached for his rosary beads, clinging to them to keep him afloat on these troubled waters. 
Poor Jamie just has his bomb dropped on him. Chapter 4. Not Good. Regimental Offices of the 46th Foot. London. The clerk, Mr. Beasley, was going through the pages John had given to Hal. This man of an unknown age, John had met 25 years prior, and he seemed old then. The imagery reminds me a bit of Ned Gowan. He's a mainstay. The clerk was supposed to be making a list of men indicted in the documents that had something to do with Cyverly. John was supposed to be meeting with Hal and Harry Corey, but they hadn't arrived yet. Knowing Beasley had a stash of French novels in his clerk's hole, John went to borrow one. He picked up a copy of Abbe Privis, Manon Lecote. He watched Beasley covertly. Beasley was a man of deep discretion. This made him invaluable to Hal, as he had been to their father, the first Earl of Melton. Beasley was disturbed by something in the documents. He stayed his pen, and he asked John if he'd read the documents. Beasley asked what Hal's reaction was to reading them. Well, he didn't break anything. He swore quite a bit in German, though. <laughs> Beasley understood the meaning. He asked if Hal had flown into a horrid passion after reading them. John would say it was so, but inquires, asking if Hal said nothing specific about the documents. No, he didn't. John asked what Beasley had noticed. Beasley instructs John to read the list of Major Cyverly's associates. Gray looks over the list, exclaims, Jesus! just like Jamie had earlier. They both are sure Hal did not notice this name. John says he'll take care of it and he'll show it to Hal. And he takes the page, tucking it into his pocket as he hears Hal's footsteps approach. They were to meet Harry at Almax. John is sure Harry isn't a member of that club. The clubs and coffee houses inspired much loyalty to patrons there was another player they were meeting who was a member there, Bartholomew Halloran, adjutant, which is a secretary from another regiment, from Cyverly's regiment. He and Harry were card-playing acquaintances. The carriage hit a pothole. Hal thinks they should have maybe walked, but then John's like, uh, no, we needed to be in this carriage, and hands him the page to read. And he says, read the list of names. Five, four, three, two, one. Jesus! Hal exclaims. <laughs> There's your three Pete people, Jamie, John, and Hal. John so dryly responds, well, yes. They are stunned by the association. It's a Twelve Trees, Edward Twelve Trees. Remember, Hal had killed his brother Nathaniel in a duel over his first wife. Harry had secured a private card room. It was to cover the meeting. He invited others to play as well. John, Hal, and he would have a few minutes to speak before the others arrived. Then Hal and John could slip away unnoticed. Clever Harry, but he could have simply gone to Argus House to share this intel instead of setting up this card game. They had little time, but Harry, of course, wanted coffee first and a kind of chit chat. John appraises Harry's face. It was a face that inspired confidence in men and sensual abandonment in women. Gray, no expert on what women find attractive though he notices Halloran appears to have been taken in by Harry's charms. Hmm. Harry cools off his coffee and chattered about his conversation with Halloran. Halloran respected Cyverly, though didn't like him. Cyverly was a good soldier, yada yada. The brothers Gray were impatient. Halloran said nothing of the mutiny in Canada, but why would he? 
It wasn't brought to a general court-martial, and it was a regimental affair. And John goes on to explain that regimental dirty laundry is not aired in public. And the public probably wouldn't be interested anyway. A court-martial was different, though, John thought. Hal says, not yet it hasn't happened. Harry says Siverly isn't popular, but he's also not disliked in the regiment. He has limited connections, money, influence, and no family name to speak of, nor does his wife. He does have some important friends, though. The Duke of Cumberland, for one. Hunting is a connection Siverly has with the Duke. He had purchased an estate in Ireland and entertained there. And they were trying to figure out the logistics of getting him in front of a board of court-martial with him being in Ireland, and oh, it's an issue. Halloran explained Siverly asked for six months personal leave, and it was granted. They don't think he resigned his commission, that he'd only asked for leave. So someone would have to go to Ireland to fetch him. Dun, dun, dun. John and Jamie's paths are converging. Ireland is the pivot. The others arrived for cards, and John partnered up with someone, but his mind was wandering. Could someone be tried for court-martial in absentia? John would need to ask Minnie. She would absolutely know. He thinks of his stepbrother, Percy Wainwright, who'd been shipped from Germany to England on sodomy charges to stand trial. And John was thinking how he had gotten over Percy, or he thought so, but every now and then his heart would leap when he would see a trim young man with dark, curly hair. So Percy and John had been lovers, it seems. John's heart jerked as he knew he'd arranged for Percy to go to Ireland, then he made his way to Rome. He calls him his erstwhile previous lover, and he wouldn't go back to Ireland. Surely not. John does not want to run into Percy Wainwright in Ireland. Hal suddenly stiffens. The Duke of Cumberland enters. Hal didn't like him, but knowing he was close to Siverly did not improve his standing in Hal's mind. And also, he and John had that eye communication they both knew they would have to continue their investigation with complete secrecy. The Duke could absolutely not catch wind of it. Then another voice causes them to further stiffen. Scheisse, Hal says emphatically. This is not a card-playing rule, someone points out. <laughs> they're supposed to use other words if their hand is poor. It was Reginald Twelve Trees, that third brother Twelve Trees. Since Hal's duel with Nathaniel, relations had been strained, to say the least. At this, Hal claimed his hand was not good. <laughs> and that's the end of the chapter. Are you sensing the difference in style this book is taking on? It's not as detailed or as rich, but it does give a sense of thrill and intrigue and mystery again adult hardy boys one thing that's very different is we see the formality of speech of the english the angling everything is political everything is strategic you've got to know what to do and there's layers and layers of secrecy and trying to decide and decipher who can be trusted we get to see the military minds of Hal and John and the suave Harry Corey. He's kind of a ladies' man, that one. So who do we need to watch for? Absolutely Quinn. Maybe the Duke of Cumberland. The two twelve trees remaining. Betty, maybe. Isabel? There's some things starting to bloom in this book. And it looks like John and Jamie are going on an Irish holiday. 
So where can you find A Dram of Outlander? Well, on Facebook, it's A Dram of Outlander page. Please go and like it. On Instagram and Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander. You can follow there. Of course, there's a dram of outlander.com and you can email a dram of outlander at gmail.com. You can also call into the voice line at 719 425 9444 to leave comments or questions about the podcast or the Scottish prisoner or Voyager or Outlander in general. You can also go on Facebook. There is a private group that's only for listeners. And if you look under groups, it's a Dram of Outlander and you can ask to join. How can you support the podcast? Please share the posts. Go to iTunes and review the podcast. It will make it easier for people to find in the future. Share it with friends. And if you'd like, you can offer financial support, whether it's a one-time offering or a monthly offering. Anything that you would like to do to help me, I so appreciate. The other thing you can do to support the podcast is come to the Twitter chats on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Join into the social media interaction. It's that simple. But I do want to hear from you. So the next podcast will be covering chapters 5 and 6, and that ends the first section of the book. I know these podcasts are shorter, but I really want to stretch this out through May, and this is the way to do it. So the, we're going to roughly get about 30 minutes out every single week. Until next time. Slange of